At its core, a lot of the technological race for future air superiority is about bringing different systems and technologies together. In previous episodes, we've covered two of them. The new, incredibly expensive and advanced sixth-generation fighter fleets, and the drones and unmanned systems that we expect to be supporting them. In these technological areas, it seems like the US is still very much at the front of the curve. But unless you decide that ramming someone with a $200 million jet is a good idea, even the most advanced fighters and combat drones on the planet are ultimately going to rely on their missiles to shoot down their opponents. And in that respect, even the US's most advanced fifth-generation aircraft, like the F-35 and F-22, are still reliant on upgraded versions of the missiles the US took into Desert Storm in 1991, the AIM-9 Sidewinder and the AIM-120 AMRAAM. When introduced, those systems were probably best in class, but in the intervening years, the rest of the world has moved on. Chinese and European manufacturers now both offer missiles that can outrange America's AMRAAM. And as air forces continue the process of updating their inventories, the future balance may hinge on who can field the best missiles to arm their next-generation fighter and drone fleets. And so today, we're going to scan the field of global air-to-air missiles, asking if and how America fell behind, and how it looks like they're planning to catch back up. To do that, I'll start with a brief history of air-to-air weapon systems and the missile evolution, and then continue into the future by asking how missiles might fit into future air combat, and what lessons the war in Ukraine might be teaching. Then, so we have a way to evaluate missiles against each other, I'll ask what makes a good missile, before testing some of those criteria against both the US infantry and the rest of the field, Russia, China, and the European Union. Having established that, yeah, American fighters are beginning to get a bit outgunned here, I'll close out by looking at some of America's next-generation missile programs and ask what impact they might have on the future balance. As always, sources will be in the description, but I do want to give special mention to a report by Professor Justin Bronk over at RUSI covering Russian and Chinese air combat capabilities. Okay, so let's start with some brief history about how aircraft have gone about shooting down other aircraft. The preface here is that through history, technology has dramatically changed the answer to a number of questions when it comes to air combat. How far, how fast, how high can you fly? what weather grounds you, and what threats can those poor sods on the ground ultimately pose to you, the pilot above it all. But for this episode, we're primarily concerned with how technology changes the answer to three specific questions. Namely, in air combat terms, how far can you see, how far can you shoot, and how accurate and effective can that shot be while evading whatever comes back in the other direction. And in the earliest days of air-to-air combat, the sensor system in question, namely the eyes of the air crew, had a massive range advantage over the primary weapon systems. Shockingly enough, when military aircraft first encountered each other in large numbers during the First World War, guided air-to-air missiles were not yet standard issue. Instead, the primary weapon of choice was going to be the gun. In the very earliest days, that might have meant crews blasting away at each other with shotguns like the world's weirdest duck hunt, but very quickly the machine gun, and later on things like the 20mm cannon, would become the primary air-to-air armaments of aircraft for decades. A key misconception I want to avoid here, however, is that technology didn't move forward during the gun era. Rather, there were incremental advances in both range and efficacy. Moving to larger calibers and new generation ammunition increased range and lethality. And while the basic maxim of point the fighter in the direction of whatever it is you want to shoot at remained basically the same, unless of course you were the Royal Air Force while it was going through its turret fighter stage, in terms of accuracy there was all the difference in the world between a hand-aimed machine gun in World War I and a Cold War era radar-assisted gun sight. But a pilot could still see much further than they could effectively shoot. So for designers and theoreticians, moving to missiles was an incredibly attractive prospect. Unlike a bullet, a missile would be able to manoeuvre during flight, increasing the probability of a hit. And with an onboard propulsion system, like a rocket motor, it would also be able to reach out considerably further. The US Air Force and Navy were particularly keen on the concept. And so when they introduced their next-generation F-4 Phantom in December 1960, It was a fast-moving brick of an aircraft with a heavy missile armament, two-man crew, and a large radar which would enable it to get the best out of its entirely missile armament. The radar would theoretically extend the range of a pilot's situational awareness, and the AIM-7 Sparrow was meant to provide the means to convert that increased awareness into burning MiGs. The US took this next-generation monster to Vietnam, where it was mostly matched up against older, less expensive, less advanced and primarily gun-armed opponents, and it immediately did... okay. Reportedly, when four Phantoms encountered four MiG-17s on April 9th, 1965, post-action analysis showed the American aircraft had fired 10 missiles to score one hit. One Phantom would be lost in turn, and while the Phantom would generally maintain a significant kill-loss ratio lead over its MiG opponents, that didn't stop the US and other F-4 operators rapidly strapping a gun pod to the thing to at least give the pilots an option, while almost all other Cold War fighters and interceptors would make the choice to go forward with missile technology 
but pay the weight and internal volume penalty necessary to fit a gun in there too. The lessons here are probably things like don't overly rely on a technology before it's ready, or to give personnel as many good tools as possible so they have an answer to whatever situation they encounter. All the while, however, missile and sensor technology was continuing to evolve, with better radar providing pilots with situational awareness over larger and larger distances, and so missile technology obviously had to continue to evolve in order to capitalise on the advantages that better sensors were giving. These missiles enabled beyond visual range, or BVR, engagements. And through the Cold War, all major air forces fell into a pattern of having at least two missiles. A short-ranged, agile, usually heat-seeking missile for dogfighting, and a longer-range missile, usually reliant on active or semi-active radar guidance, to enable pilots to send their regards to each other well over the horizon. Basically, everyone developed a BVR capability. And some, like the US Navy, developed very BVR capabilities. Faced with the threat of Soviet aircraft firing very long-ranged anti-ship cruise missiles, potentially with nuclear warheads, the Navy decided it didn't like scenarios where it couldn't shoot back and developed the combination of the F-14 Tomcat and AIM-54 Phoenix. In its sea version, the Phoenix weighed more than 1,000 pounds, or about 460 kilos, had a listed operational range of approximately 100 nautical miles, about 180 kilometres, and was such a big boy of a missile that if a Tomcat took off with a full load of six of them, it would be too heavy on return for a safe carrier landing, leaving the pilot with a choice between jettisoning one or more very expensive missiles, or alternatively just picking a nearby target and starting World War III because, after all, it would be a shame to waste one. Phoenix left US service within a few years of the Tomcats that carried them. But by Desert Storm in 1991, the US had both of its mainstay air-to-air missiles that we'll talk about today. The AIM-9 Sidewinder is the short-range option, and the AIM-120 Advanced Medium-Range Air-to-Air Missile, or AMRAM, as what would eventually become every American pilot's preferred option for downing targets at a distance. This missile was a serious step up from what had come before. And during the 1990s, whenever the AMRAM encountered targets, whether that be an Iraqi MiG-25 or Serbian MiG-29s, the resulting encounter was exactly the way the US Air Force likes it. Crushingly unfair and one-sided. In the 2020s, however, there's no doubt that air combat technology is changing. Better sensors, unmanned systems, and an entirely new generation of fighters are beginning to take the stage. So let's ask the question, how may the air combat environment be changing? And what are militaries likely to want missiles to bring to the table in that environment in order to deter, and if necessary, defeat potential competitors? And in answering that question, I want to stress that there has never been universal agreement on what the future of air combat looks like. For example, during parts of the Cold War, you had different schools of thought as to what ranges future air combat were likely to be fought at, and as a result, what made a good aircraft and a good set of missiles. At one extreme, you had the school of thought that very much still put agility front and centre. Often they foresaw relatively short engagement ranges, perhaps because many aircraft would be keeping their radars in passive mode in order to avoid detection, and as a result, they wanted to be ready for the dogfight. They came up with theories to describe the ideal fighter based on agility and energy, and prize capabilities like the supermaneuverability that you see in some fourth generation and fifth generation fighters. The Soviet and later Russian flanker series, for example, isn't just a fast aircraft. Some versions of it are also extraordinarily agile and capable of some truly insane high alpha bullshit. Think, for example, of everyone's airshow favourite, the Cobra Maneuver. This is an intense maneuver which has plenty of utility, allowing a pilot to do things like impress airshow crowds, bleed off a lot of very valuable energy incredibly quickly, and present the maximum possible cross-section of his or her aircraft to an incoming missile, to the point where a teenager with 10 hours in DCS would probably be able to get a lock and make the shot. Agility is obviously still a factor in aircraft design and plays a role in certain combat scenarios. Every time someone sets up a within-visual-range exercise between the F-22 and the Eurofighter, or the F-35 and a clean F-16, for example, agility is one of the factors that might lead to the Eurofighters and the F-16 scoring their very well-publicised wins because designers have to make a lot of sacrifices to make an aircraft stealthy, and those design elements don't help you much if the exercise begins at a close enough range that the opponent can get a lock on you using the Mark I eyeball, a system that, for the moment, all fighters still come equipped with. At the other extreme were those who foresaw future air combat as basically a game of point and click, where the maverick of the future doesn't get into any dramatic dogfights, blasting Sukhoi 57s out of the sky with his aircraft's cannon, but instead increasingly capable sensors would identify targets at very long distances, data links and better fusion would enable those sensors to convert those blips into high-confidence targets, and the role of the fighter aircraft, or later on the drone supporting them, would primarily be just to yeet very long-range missiles at those blips until they went away. In this sort of fighting, the most valuable attributes for an aircraft probably wouldn't be agility, 
but rather its sensors, its data link, the capability of its missiles, and factors like speed and altitude that would give those missiles their range. And in the 21st century, while no doubt debates will continue, most forces seem to be proceeding on the understanding that technology, awareness and reach are probably much more important than factors like sheer agility, with modern air combat often coming from the Han Solo school of thought, where whoever shoots first is likely to win, because an aircraft that's been fired on might be hit and destroyed, and even if it isn't, is probably spending its time and energy evading that missile, rather than focusing on continuing its mission or fighting back. As a Rusi report, which you'll find linked in the description, put it, quote, modern air combat is determined first and foremost by which side is able to generate and sustain superior situational awareness over the other. This is governed by a combination of superior sensors, signature minimization, data link-enabled sharing of information between different assets, in-cockpit interfaces, and crew proficiency. A situational awareness advantage will allow one side to position assets and then manoeuvre so as to begin and conduct an engagement on the most favourable terms, and at least to get the first shots of an engagement. End quote. So all else being equal, if you can see first and decide to shoot first, you probably have the advantage. And because of that, we've seen a massive technological race between the means of detection and the means of avoiding detection. Fifth-generation aircraft are commonly defined by their adoption of what are commonly called stealthy features that make them harder to detect using radar. While on the other side of the equation, the increasingly widespread adoption of active electronically scanned array radars are both much harder to jam and much harder to trace than older systems. So some aircraft are going to be able to see further and more safely than older versions, increasing the pilot's situational awareness. Add in the ability to connect multiple sensors together using data links, and then fuse it together into something cohesive and useful. And the biggest advances in fighter capability over the last two decades probably haven't been their physical performance so much, but the much increased situational awareness they provide, with pilots seeing further and better than ever before. But remember, how far you can see was only one of our three core questions. This is where having a better missile can be a major advantage. If two blokes meet for a duel on an open field 100 metres apart, but one bloke's carrying a crowbar and the other an AR-15, that absolutely isn't a fair fight. They can both see each other, they both have equal situational awareness, but there is a gross asymmetry in their ability to do anything with that information. As Rusi puts it, quote, if both sides have relatively comparable situational awareness about the other's position, identity, and heading prior to getting within missile range, then the side with superior effective missile range has a significant advantage, end quote. And to an extent, it may even be more important than that. Because you can imagine situations where the distance both sides can see isn't equal, but discrepancies in missile range prevent that being the advantage it could be. Stealth features, for example, don't make an aircraft invisible, they just reduce the distance at which that aircraft can be detected. But whether the advantage that gives you is crushing or less significant might come down to the range of your missiles. To paraphrase General Kelly of US Air Combat Command, if you have to push stealth aircraft into ranges where everyone is observable anyway, because, for example, your limited missile range forces you to do so, then there really isn't much point in having a very expensive stealth fighter force. Being able to see your opponent long before they can see you is great, but it's not quite as great if you can't shoot as far as they can see. And while it's obviously important not to overlearn the lessons of any one conflict, I'd argue the war in Ukraine mostly confirms the great value that being able to see further and shoot further can have. Russia has more modern fighters, more modern missiles, more modern sensors, and VKS fighters will often have an energy advantage because they can fly at high altitudes behind their own air defence systems, something which increases the reach of their missiles and decreases the relative reach of Ukrainian ones. And so outside some chaotic situations in the earlier stages of the war, for the most part, Russian fighters have been content to lob long-range air-to-air missiles at Ukrainian targets without really having to worry about Ukrainian fighters returning the favour. They're obviously still vulnerable if the Patriot road trip rolls round, but in air-to-air -air combat terms, it's mostly long-range and mostly one way. And Ukraine really probably only gives us a decent picture of air warfare circa 2005, not 2035. In the future, as we've talked about before, the introduction of things like air combat drones will again complicate both the situational awareness and engagement question. Being able to disperse sensors onto networks of data link drones might increase situational awareness, making the air battlefield more transparent in the same way the ground has grown more transparent. And at the same time, there are plenty of concepts for separating some of the duty for firing missiles from the fifth or sixth generation fighters that can operate in high-risk airspace. Whether that means putting missiles on a drone accompanying the manned platform, or whether that means having other aircraft like a fourth generation missile truck hanging out in a low threat zone, carrying a bunch of missiles that it can then lob at targets identified by a stealthier, more forward position platform. The importance of that sort of ability to bring a ton of missiles to the fight may indeed be at something of a premium. 
Because even if the high consumption rates we've seen in Ukraine don't hold true in future conflicts, and they may, the sky is now very likely to be full of drones as well as manned platforms, and you're probably going to want to have enough munitions available to shoot those down as well. So in a nutshell, you'll probably be able to see further, and with that growing superpower will come an imperative to be able to shoot further and shoot more often than current fleets and inventories will allow. I've discussed all these concepts before in previous videos, and I'll leave a link in the description if you missed it. A lot of these employment concepts, however, would probably benefit from missiles a little bit different to what countries are fielding today. Small drones might benefit from smaller missiles suitable for their internal storage. A fourth-generation missile truck that has to hang back from the fighting might want longer and longer range munitions to enable to engage safely. Or alternatively, you might want more reach to take out the valuable enabling aircraft that the other side might be relying on. You may not be able to find and target your opponent's fifth or sixth generation fighters. But if you can splash the AWACS aircraft that allows them to see, or the tankers that keep them fueled, then to an extent, you might not have to. Of course, the pilots of these aircraft know how valuable they are, just ask them. And so, occasional Russian A-50 aside, they're likely to hang back out of regular engagement range. No one is going to have any trouble spotting the giant aircraft with the massive radar dome on top of it. But if you don't have a missile capable of turning that situational awareness into a kill, then the actual value of that awareness is going to be much diminished. There's also a final point here, I think, which could apply to many areas of military or even civilian development, but which I'd argue historically has definitely applied in air-to-air -air combat. And that's the observation that having an advantage across multiple systems categories, multiple capabilities, is often compounding, with the total result being greater than the sum of its parts. Think of it like this. Imagine Pavel is a talented marksman. His unit wants him to start doing long-range sniper duty and he's looking for ways to increase his effectiveness. You could give him a scope to make it easier to find and aim at targets, but if he's still using a shipbox rifle and ancient ammo, he's probably not going to hit it anyway. Similarly, just handing him a couple of boxes of match-grade ammunition might help a bit, but as long as the rifle is still terrible and there's no optic, there's sort of a limit to the upside. But if you start combining improvements, give him an accuratized rifle, match grade ammunition, a good optic, pair him up with a decent spotter, and now you're talking. Similar concepts might apply in air combat. All else being equal, a pilot with better situational awareness is going to have an advantage, the pilot flying the better plane is going to have an advantage, and the pilot with the better missiles is going to have an advantage. While a pilot with all three is going to violently seal club the opposition, sweep the skies clean like they're an ace combat protagonist, then fly back to base, get a bev out of the esky, and talk to someone about putting the ace markings on their plane. If you want air dominance, it might not be enough to have the best planes or the best pilots. You're going to want them to have the best missiles as well. Okay, so we've apparently decided that we need better missiles. So your next question is then probably, what might make a missile good or bad? Because if there's one constant in designing systems for the military, it's that there are always trade-offs. You would probably always like to have more speed, range, and everything that goes into that wonderful umbrella term, kinematic performance, but chasing more of everything blindly is probably going to come with trade-offs. So congratulations, it's time for you to design an air-to-air -air missile, and so I'm going to talk you through four of the top-level decisions you have to make and factors you're going to have to balance. Step one in this Build-A-Bear-esque journey, pick a propulsion system and your desired performance characteristics. For propulsion, two major options would be rocket or ramjet. Most systems out there still use a solid rocket motor. It's simple, proven technology that gives your missile the maximum possible acceleration when you first launch it. If you want the maximum possible amount of go for 10 seconds after you let rip with a thing, the rocket motor is probably the way to go. The problem is, after that rocket motor burns out, the missile is mostly coasting. And so some very modern long-ranged air-to-air missiles like the European Meteor use a ramjet instead. That's more complex and means your missile is probably not going to have as much acceleration right after you launch it, but because it spreads its burn over a much, much longer period of time, it's going to be more agile in the later stages of its flight. In between, you might have an option like a pulsed rocket motor, which can split its burn up into multiple segments, but which still doesn't have the same level of flexibility and sustain as the ramjet. In terms of the actual performance characteristics that your propulsion and other factors gives your missile, there's a few obvious ones you're probably going to look to as part of an evaluation. Things like range, speed, and agility should be fairly obvious. Some missiles are optimized to be able to pull high-G maneuvers that would rip the wings off an aircraft and pulp a pilot in their seat, while others might have comparatively much smaller control surfaces to minimize drag and maximize range. They still might be able to embarrass an aircraft held back by the limitations of what the human body can survive, but they might be a little less over-the-top about it. These and other factors go into contributing to some derived elements that we'll talk about a little more later, but which really come down to shaping that third question we raised at the start. How effectively and accurately can you shoot? Important terms here might be things like probability of kill, or PK, 
which as you probably guessed, is the probability when you fire a missile that it's going to do what it's meant to do and kill the target. While another relevant term would be the no escape zone, which is the area within which if you fire a missile, you're going to have a high PK even against a target that knows the attack is coming and they're probably buggered. All else being equal, more range and performance can probably help with both. Saying that you have a missile in the 100km maximum range bracket probably doesn't mean that you're going to be downing fully aware fighter-sized targets at 100km, but the range at which you can effectively do so, your no escape zone, may still be much longer for a 100km range missile than for a 50k one. Of course, all the energy and range in the world isn't going to help you if your missile doesn't have a decent seeker on it. Here again, there are a couple of major options, and NATO actually has brevity codes to represent the main ones. Semi-active radar homing is pretty old school technology at this point, and refers to a missile that relies on the launching aircraft to find the target, keep that target in their sights, and guide the missile onto it. The advantage is the system can rely on the probably much larger, more powerful radar on the aircraft itself, but the disadvantages, as highlighted in Ukraine with the R-27 missile, is that it means the launching aircraft has to keep their nose pointed at the target all the way until impact. This is often a great way to get shot down, and a reason the technology has fallen out of favour. But if you do decide to go retro with your design, the NATO brevity code for firing off one of these missiles is FOX-1. Instead, more modern missiles are often capable of active radar homing. This is where the missile itself has a radar in the nose, and so at some point in its flight profile, potentially well after the missile has been launched if we're talking about a lock-after-launch scenario, the missile will acquire the target with its own onboard radar sensor and guide its way in. This is often the option used on longer-ranged air-to-air missiles because it adds the benefit of additional range and a fire-and-forget functionality where a pilot can fire off a missile and then continue manoeuvring while it makes its way towards a target. The NATO brevity code for these missiles is FOX-3. Then, in the middle, you have every dogfighter's favourite. FOX-2 is the brevity code for IR homing missiles, otherwise known as heat seekers. As advanced as technology has gotten, no one has yet found a way to make a combat aircraft which doesn't generate a significant amount of heat, leaving an opportunity for IR seekers. This option might limit how far you can shoot compared to a radar homer, but it's not going to trigger a radar warning receiver, and it's not going to care about a lot of the countermeasures a radar seeker would. In terms of rating how good a seeker is, the distance it can see, its reliability, accuracy, and resistance to countermeasures all matter. That last one is important and is something that Hollywood has been stubbornly ignoring. A traditional countermeasure to FOX 2s, for example, is an aircraft dumping flares behind it, because then the seeker's going to see balls of heat everywhere and potentially go chasing after one like a distracted puppy. But more modern IR missiles often use imaging seekers. That means the missile is less likely to do tactically suboptimal things like locking onto the sun, or if suddenly confronted with a bunch of heat signatures after an aircraft dumps flares, then ideally the missile should be able to tell that the correct target is still the one that is in fact shaped like a plane. If you've seen the latest Top Gun film, the Op4 clearly skipped on that upgrade. I'd also note that even once you pick your seeker, there might be room for more bling. Some missiles can lock on after launch, some can launch off bore sight, some can take their cues from a pilot's helmet sight so they merely have to look at a target in order to acquire it, and often those same missiles are the ones that can make off bore sight shots. There are also concepts for missiles that combine multiple seeker types and as technology improves, seekers are only going to get better. Now, a lot of the things we just talked about, range, speed, the power of the seeker head, or even things like warhead size, can, all else being equal, usually just be increased by making the missile bigger. And it's for that reason that I have to highlight form factor and weight as another design consideration. Because the larger and heavier the missile, the fewer an aircraft can carry, the greater the performance loss caused by carrying it, and in the case of 5th gen fighters, whether the weapon will fit inside an internal weapons bay, which is necessary for the whole stealthy thing. For a fixed warhead size, getting performance out of a smaller missile is going to be harder than if you can design something that weighs as much as an old mini miner and sling it under a MiG-31 the way the Russians do. Plus, of course, while you're making decisions on all of the above, you have to consider cost and availability. Obviously, no one's ever going to be unhappy about their missile having really great performance, but if you're undertaking planning for an Air Force as a whole, you're probably going to prefer to have thousands of decent missiles available, rather than a handful of gold-plated showpieces that you're going to use up on day one of a conflict. Put all this together, and the answer to what makes a good missile will often depend on the role it's being used for. Most air forces value different aspects for different roles, and as a result, keep at least a couple of different missiles in inventory. For the purpose of this presentation, though, I'm going to broadly split them into three categories. Comparatively short, mostly visual-range dogfighting missiles that need to be highly agile, preferably fairly small, and in most air forces are going to combine a solid rocket motor with an IR seeker. Then just about everyone is going to have their beyond visual range missile. 
Almost certainly with active radar guidance and the range to reach out 100 kilometres or more, but a form factor that's still usually going to be weapons bay friendly. Finally, there's a third category which can sometimes blur with a second one, and these are your very long range missiles. And these are generally going to be missiles that sacrifice form factor, they're big, in exchange for even more range. Given the context we started with is improving sensors and the value in being able to shoot as far as you can see, I'm mostly going to be glossing over the shorter range missiles. But whatever system we're looking at, keep the four factors in mind. Propulsion type and kinematic performance, seeker type and capability, form factor, and how much trauma purchasing the thing is going to cause the people at Treasury. At this point, we're about to start diving into specific missile inventories. So here comes everyone's favourite part of every presentation, some caveats. Firstly, the performance characteristics and technical details of a lot of missiles are going to be highly sensitive and often classified. Governments may choose to under or overestimate likely performance in their public releases, and so everything from here on out may be wrong. Secondly, when we are talking about performance characteristics, it's not always apples for apples comparisons. Range for a missile, for example, is highly contextual. How fast and how high is the launch platform? What's the target? Can it maneuver, etc.? Your range against a cargo aircraft flying 40,000 feet below you but in your direction is going to be much, much further than against an agile fighter at your altitude flying directly away from you. Finally, how a missile actually performs might owe a lot to the systems and the context around it. If you have missiles that can reach well over the horizon, for example, but you tell your pilots that they cannot fire unless they first visually identify a target, then you probably shouldn't blame the missile when you don't get many beyond visual range kills. Similarly, to go back to our opening questions, if you don't have the sensors to see a target at long range, then you may not derive much utility from missiles that allow you to engage out to that distance. All right, fine print out of the way, let's get back to it. We've gone over some features that might make a good missile, so let's move on to looking at the two main air-to-air missiles in the US inventory and how they might stack up. The AIM-9 Sidewinder is by far the older of the two. The original version of this system entered service in 1956 and first saw combat in 1958. In most of its iterations, this has been a relatively light, relatively short-range, infrared homing missile, although the missile has come a long way from its original iterations. In its original version, for example, the Sidewinder worked best in a tail chase, where the Seeker could very clearly make out the giant heat blob that was the enemy's engine, and track accordingly. The AIM-9L upgrade from the late 1970s turned the missile into one that could attack from all aspects which helped increase the proportion of launch missiles that hit their targets from something like 10-15% to during the Vietnam War to about 80% when used by the British during the Falklands War. Then, in the early 2000s, we saw the arrival of the AIM-9X, a new version which gave this old dog some very new tricks. The missile now had an imaging IR seeker that probably didn't give a shit about your flares, or that, to be fair, claimed countermeasure resistance is always something of an open question when it comes to most missiles. Compatibility with helmet-mounted sights, off-bore sight firing capability, truly insane levels of agility, and despite the missile getting ever closer to its 70th birthday, the new versions and upgrades continue. So to use our factors from earlier, you have a small form factor, an imaging IR seeker, relatively low cost, insane agility, but in terms of range, the official Air Force claim is only more than 10 miles. At longer ranges, since the early 90s, the AMRAM has been the better option. Progressive upgrades, tuned performance and added features with reach of around 100 kilometers for some sea versions, to an estimated 160 kilometers, or about 86 nautical miles, in the case of the most recent D version. And as the missile evolved and continued to demonstrate its capabilities, the world took notice, to the point where, as you can see, if you operated a major air force but don't use either French, Russian, or Chinese equipment, there were very, very decent odds that you would buy and field AMRAM. Now, if you're wondering why having fielded a winner in the form of the AIM-120, America didn't get started on fielding a replacement to maintain its dominance, the answer, kind of like in our episode on long-range fires, is that they did. For example, in the 2010s, there was the Next Generation Missile Program, which was intended to replace AMRAM, with a more advanced missile capable of both doing the job of the AIM-120 and also the AGM-88 Harm anti-radiation missile. That missile ended up cancelled in the 2013 budget request which might sound like a short-sighted decision in 2023, but you have to remember the context of the time. In 2013, the American military was primarily concerned with counterinsurgency. Russia hadn't yet annexed Crimea, the Europeans were still openly selling weapon systems to the Russian military, and the PLAAF was still years away from introducing the J-20 or the PL-15. And faced with a wide array of competing priorities, time and time again, just upgrading the AMRAM a bit more, one out as the preferred option, again and again because the design and infrastructure and tooling and workforce were all there. 
with historical production rates somewhere between 5 and 800 missiles per year, reaching nearly 1,200 per annum more recently. The problem with this story for continued prominence for the AIM-9 and AIM-120 is that eventually you can come to be constrained by the core design of something. And eventually you might have changed so much that you end up in a missile of Theseus situation and you would have been better off just starting from scratch. And while AMRAM may have been dominant when it first entered service, the passage of time has brought competition. So if we're going to map out some of the competitors in the field, given recent events, we should probably start with Russia. The Soviet Air Forces and Defense Industrial Base had always understood it would be difficult to keep up with the USAF and various NATO allies. But they were nonetheless able to produce some incredibly lethal aircraft. And, especially as the Cold War was coming to an end, either fielding or developing missiles that would give their aircraft a reasonable answer to America's AIM-9 and AIM-120. The R-73 and R-74, NATO designation AA-11 Archer, are basically the AIM-9 analogues of Soviet and post-Soviet air forces. Compared to the Sidewinder, the Archer is very much a late Cold War warrior, entering service in the 1980s. R-74M is basically a modernization of the original 73. The missile got an upgraded seeker with additional range and additional off ball sight capability, presumably to give the Russian fighter designs even more of a shot in the dogfights they so clearly crave. A lot of the missiles in inventory are going to be missing some of the blingy features on American, European, or Chinese missiles. Plus, we've seen some feedback come out of Ukraine that the older versions of the R-73 the Ukrainians use sometimes have difficulty targeting small drones if conditions happen to be cloudy. But of course, I'm sure we can all safely presume that any future peer-on-peer aerial warfare will include neither drones nor clouds, so the existing R-73 stocks should be fine. More seriously, this is probably a dangerous missile, and a successor is believed to be in the works. The Russian answer to the AMRAM, however, is the R-77, NATO reporting name ADA. Indeed, when this thing was first showed off in the 1990s, some journalists took to calling it the Amramsky. Rusi assesses the R-77-1 version, which entered service in 2010, as having inferior long-range performance to the A120C series, but overall I'd note this is still a relatively capable peer for the AMRAM. And as Rusi notes, Russia is believed to be working on a new modernised version, with a dual-pulse rocket motor, adaptation for internal carriage by the Sukhoi-57, and performance, quote, claimed to be comparable to the AIM-120C7, end quote. That would give Russia a FOX-3, which is probably uncomfortably close in performance to the vast majority of air-to-air missiles in the American inventory. Sure, the latest D version might still have more reach, but those are hardly going to replace every existing missile overnight. Russia also has their very long-range air-to-air missile, which we've talked about before. This is the R-37M, NATO reporting name AA-13 Axe Head, and it offers extreme range, most likely beyond that of Meteor or the latest versions of the AIM-120, hypersonic speeds for part of its flight profile, and a massive 60-kilogram warhead. Of course, we've established that if you want to make a missile great in some respects, you're probably going to have to sacrifice others. And for the R-37, those sacrifices are form factor, cost, and agility. The Russians basically made R-37 go further by making it bigger. And there's no way you're going to fit more than half a ton of missile inside the internal bay of a stealth aircraft. It's also assessed to be more expensive than the R-77. And while it's probably well adapted for taking down enablers, things like tankers and AWACS, in Ukraine, the probability of kill when fired against fighter-sized targets that are capable of maneuvering doesn't appear to have been that great. But the way the axe head is used also highlights the importance of context when you're looking at a missile data sheet. On its own, the R-37 reads as having great range and payload. But with that sort of form factor, this wouldn't exactly be a practical weapon for the likes of F-16 or MiG-29. But the Russian inventory features MiG-31. And MiG-31 is an absolute chonker of a high-speed, high-altitude interceptor. And the aircraft carries the Zaslon P radar, which is specifically optimised for identifying small targets that might be hugging the ground. Originally, that was probably meant to be cruise missiles, but it doesn't have to be. And so you've got all the pieces coming together for a brute force solution to the energy problem. You have an aircraft with enough go to lift a useful payload of R-37s up to a very high altitude, accelerate them to a high speed before they launch, and then lob them at targets that are likely to be in a much lower energy state, flying low and slow. The combination creates a system with even more range than you might expect, and while the missile may not be particularly agile, if you don't know it's coming, that might be all she bloody wrote. In summation, R-77-1 is broadly appeared to some older versions of the AMRAM. Like AMRAM, it uses rocket propulsion, active radar guidance, and the form factor is broadly similar. The missile likely isn't enough to provide advantage over American aircraft, especially those with stealthy features and more modern sensors, and against the AMRAM D model is likely to suffer a significant range disadvantage. Newer versions might redress that balance, but time will tell. R-37 and R-37M extend the range bracket, 
but at the expense of both form factor and ability to hit an aware and manoeuvring target. As mentioned, Russia also has a number of missile design or improvement programs. But if you're talking about their prospect of fielding large numbers of a system that will outrange something like the AMRAM-D, I think there are likely to be barriers that have nothing to do with the capability of Russia's designers or manufacturers. The VKS is arguably in a position where there is a lot it needs to do in order to be a peer competitor, without it being at all clear how the country will resource it all. Most of the air-to-air missile stock is probably old and nearing the end of its lifetime. It needs to be refreshed. A lot of airframes are going to need life extension or replacement. To be competitive, the fighters all probably need IESA radars and better data links as a bare minimum. And whatever your opinion on the Sukhoi 57 as a platform and all the new missiles that are supposedly being designed to go along with it, an aircraft is probably only going to have a significant impact if you take the F-35 or J-20 approach and actually build the thing. In terms of missiles, Russia has probably achieved rough parity with the American AIM-9 Sidewinder and most versions of the AMRAM while also having a very long-range option available. But while Russian industry may have been able to design to parity, with all the pressures that little thing called the war in Ukraine place on the Russian military budget, I would be deeply sceptical of Russia's ability to design and field something truly superior in any significant numbers over the short and medium term. And so while Russian missile development has been relatively slow and disrupted by the 1990s, it's arguably the People's Republic of China that have raced ahead. In its very earliest stages, the missile armament of PLAAF aircraft looked very much like the Soviet armament. PL-1, for example, was basically the Soviet AA-1, a pretty early, pretty basic beam-riding missile. The PL-1 would then face off against the AIM-9B in a couple of air combats in the late 1950s, which probably just confirmed everyone's suspicions that the PL-1 was a bit trash and something better was needed. But through most of the Cold War, the PLAAF had a missile armament that was basically equivalent to what vinyl is today dramatically less effective than just about every other competing technology, but endowed with a certain retro nostalgic appeal. In the 90s, however, the PLAAF got the PL-8, which, it has to be said, looks suspiciously like an Israeli Python 3, but which, especially alongside some of the updates that would come in the early 21st century, gave the Chinese a dogfighting IR-seeking missile with a range of about 12 miles and an all-aspect seeker but which gave the PLAAF a much more serviceable missile in this category. The need for a longer-range weapon gave us PL-11, which this time didn't look like an Israeli Python 3, but rather an Italian system with a link back to the American AIM-7. In short, go back even just two decades, and the Chinese arsenal was very C-tier. Inferior not just to many Western offerings, but contemporary Russian ones as well. But come the mid-2000s, we see a new generation of Chinese air-to-air missiles. And at this point, we probably have to start talking rough parity with many of their competitors. The PL-10 is the new dogfighting missile, and it's reportedly no slouch. In terms of propulsion, it uses a solid rocket booster, and in terms of overall kinematic performance, Rusi describes it as being, quote, comparable to the European ASRAM and IRST missiles with superior kinematic performance to the American AIM-9X Sidewinder. They note that it's helmet sight compatible, can perform all aspect shots at very high G loadings, has a lock-on launch capability, and a modern imaging infrared seeker that is highly resistant to decoys, and so presumably goes on the list of systems that are banned from the Top Gun 3 set. Now, on the basis of all of those features, some might argue this missile is superior to the American AIM-9X, but what those people obviously forget is the importance of combat-proven technology. AIM-9X has been used to shoot down a number of balloons. PL-10 hasn't, so checkmate PL-10. The 10's bigger brother, the PL-12, was China's first truly indigenous active radar missile. It entered service in 2005, is laid out very much like an AMRAM, and according to Rusi, its development was reportedly at least partly based on imported Russian R-77 seeker heads. But whatever its provenance or inspiration, PL-12 appears to have given Beijing an air-to-air weapon with a range somewhere between AIM-120B and C-5. There are also believed to have been some upgraded and modernised versions of the PL-12, but we're going to mostly skip over those because PL-12 is very much the ignored middle child of the Chinese long-range air-to-air missile family. The 11 gets to claim that it was and always will be first, and everyone nowadays just wants to talk about the more popular younger child, which we'll get to in a moment. But before we do, I'll just give you a quick side note. Finding good quality close-up images of Chinese air-to-air missiles that aren't mock-ups at arm shows is actually relatively difficult. And going googling for them, I did discover a couple of things about these missiles I didn't know going in. Like, for example, there appears to be this website offering to sell me a PL-8 missile for 45 Australian dollars in women's size small. Suffice to say, this is not how most international arms supply agreements are done, but legal and personal privacy issues aside, if I had a spare 45 bucks and literally no other purpose on the planet that I could put it towards, 
I would be kind of interested to see what would turn up if I ordered a PLA air-to-air missile in a men's US-5 shoe size. Now with that aside done, let's get to the main event. The pacing challenge and favourite of airshow paparazzi everywhere, the Chinese PL-15. If PL-12 was China's attempt to equal the AMRAAM, PL-15 is the attempt to go well beyond it. Rusi assesses that the dual-pulse rocket motor on the PL-15 puts it in the 200km maximum range class. That is 40 kilometers beyond the stated maximum range of the latest versions of the AMRAAM, and very roughly twice what the oldest versions could manage. That means if a US pilot with an AIM-120D is making a maximum range shot, all else being equal, a PL-15 being fired back might have significantly more spare energy to play with. The missile's also believed to have a miniature AESA seeker, and improved in-flight data links that make this thing harder to see, harder to jam, and more able to reach out and touch targets at long range than any previous Chinese design. It also notably fits in the internal weapons bay of the Chinese J-20 fifth generation fighter, meaning that not only is this a missile with reach, it can be carried and deployed by an aircraft with a combination of sensors and some low observability features that make it more likely that it gets launched from a position where it's really, really going to hurt. Now, you might be asking the question, how do they get that much more performance out of the system compared to the A120D? And besides the obvious advantage of starting with a clean slate design rather than iterating something which is decades old at this point, part of the sacrifice, because there's always a sacrifice, was the missile's form factor. The missile is roughly four meters long, considerably longer than the AMRAAM, which might normally pose a problem for countries trying to store this thing in the internal weapons bay of a stealthy aircraft. But of course, Beijing found a way around that problem, by just, you know, making the J-20 itself considerably larger than aircraft like the F-35. More plane equals more internal volume, equals the ability to keep a four-pack of four-metre metal tubes in your bay just fine. Now, of course, we're mostly going off a mixture of guesswork and official information when it comes to the PL-15's actual performance. The PLAAF hasn't exactly been out there using these things in combat, and no one's published a manual yet. Now, my personal solution to that problem would be to add the missile to War Thunder, make it terrible, and then wait for someone in China to inevitably post the full technical details to prove that it's actually pretty good. But assuming the 2020's best source of classified military information on sensitive technology doesn't come through for us, I will note that it's been claimed that China will be selling a downgraded version of the PL-15 to Pakistan with a maximum range of 145 kilometers. Notably, that is still a missile with some serious legs on it. But so far, we can't be sure exactly how much better the original Chinese version performs. But we can be fairly confident that China is working on a system with an even longer range. This missile, tentatively designated PL-17, clearly looks to be abandoning the form factor requirement of fitting into a J-20 weapons bay in exchange for a much longer reach. The missile appears to be approximately 6 metres long, so very much external carriage only. And the very low profile and single set of quite small manoeuvring fins at the back there basically suggests that whatever team was given the task of designing this thing was given a design brief which consisted entirely of the word range written in 72 point font and then underlined 16 times. In that task, they may have succeeded with Rusi noting, quote, it appears to have a multi-mode seeker with an active radar and IR homing capabilities and a range in the 400 kilometer class with a very high altitude cruise phase. They would go on to note that as such, this weapon poses a formidable threat to tankers and other enablers. Basically, PL-17 appears to take what Phoenix and R-37 are trying to do, packs it into a sleeker form, and dials the range up even further. Against agile targets, PL-17 probably isn't the weapon of choice. And given the size, of course, you'll only be seeing this on fourth-generation missile trucks, not snuck close to the opponent in a J-20's weapons bay. But if you are a slow, obvious target, like an AWACS, a tanker, or a Kirov airship, this thing might be your next-generation worst nightmare. And to put that range into perspective, if the Ukrainian Air Force was operating something with those performance characteristics right now, they could be engaging targets flying over Sevastopol in Crimea without getting within 100 kilometers of the front line. So I'd argue what you're seeing here is a continued rapid evolution in the capabilities of the Chinese Air Force. And in just about every technical respect, they're probably now ahead of where Russia is. And in terms of frontline missile systems, PL-15 offers a lot more than R-77M, and if it performs anything like advertised, PL-17 has considerable advantages over R-37M. PL-15 uses a more advanced type of rocket motor than AMRAAM, likely has significantly greater range and performance than AMRAAM, while having most of the blingy seeker and networking features expected of modern air-to-air -air missiles. Its form factor is slightly larger, but still fifth generation friendly. PL-17, by contrast, doesn't have a direct American equivalent. And while it has that much larger form factor, 
In terms of range, if the Rusi reporting is accurate, it significantly more than doubles the maximum reach of the latest version of the AMRAAM. And all this combines to give PL-88 aircraft, all else being equal, a potential disadvantage in situational awareness versus their often more stealthy US opponents, but a potentially significant advantage in how far their weapons can shoot. And here's the thing. When it comes to missiles that have jumped ahead of AMRAAM in the BVR game, I'd argue it's actually not just the Chinese who have done so. Because across the Atlantic from the American East Coast, the European missile giants have been busy. And in recent years, they may have come up with a world beater. Now, in the interest of time, I can't cover every air-to-air missile used by NATO aircraft in Europe. And that's pretty much because, despite NATO encouraging standardization on paper, many, many air-to-air missile joint development programs have just ended up with the various partners breaking up and deciding to build their own. And so the Brits use the ASRAM, the French the MICA series, and the Germans have IRIS-T as their dogfighting missile, which, presumably because in Germany you can't get budget approval for anything that might be deemed an offensive weapon, is advertised as having a secondary self-defend function where the pilot can task the missile against an incoming missile, performing the aerospace equivalent of defending yourself by shooting down a bullet with another bullet. Now, there can be benefits to going your own way on missile procurement, for example, by protecting a local manufacturer, like the manufacturer of the ASRAM, MBDA UK, or the manufacturer of the French MICA, MBDA France, and in the case of the next missile I want to talk about, once again, MBDA. So let's have a chat about Europe's FOX-3 of choice, and possibly the best in the field, the Meteor. While many of the missiles we've talked about today are millennials or older, Meteor, like PL-15, is Gen Alpha through and through. A clean sheet design that came into service in 2016, there's a lot that Meteor can offer. In terms of form factor, the thing is basically an AMRAAM, 3.6 metres long, 190 kilos, and depending on the version, even the costs are pretty similar. But when you start talking about capability, the comparison diverges quickly. The biggest difference with the Meteor is the method of propulsion. Instead of a more conventional rocket engine, Meteor is equipped with a ramjet, and that has massive implications for both the missile's range and also its performance in a range of scenarios. In range terms, this has been described as a 200km class missile. That puts it in the same category as things like the larger PL-15 and longer range than AMRAAM-D or R-77. But the advantages of that ramjet motor goes beyond just the raw range figures. A conventional rocket-powered missile like an AMRAAM-C will dump most of its energy soon after launch and then mostly coast to its target. Meteor, by contrast, is burning throughout its entire flight. For example, it means that if the missile is fired at a relatively low level, it's going to be more capable to first climb to the target altitude and then still be burning when it gets up into that thinner atmosphere and doing so is more efficient. This is one reason why I brought Meteor up in the context of Ukraine in the past. If you have an environment where pilots are having to fly at very low level in order to avoid air defences, as they are in Ukraine... Meteor is going to give those pilots a much better chance of engaging opposing targets at high altitude than a missile like the AIM-120D. That ramjet also means that the missile is better able to adapt to any manoeuvres the target might make, and as a result, the so-called no-escape zone is much larger. Remember, against a sufficiently agile and jamming-resistant missile, evasion is pretty much an energy game. And compared to a lot of its rivals, the Meteor just has a lot more energy to give. It can outrun you, outturn you, and has the endurance to just keep going. To the point where if you're in an engagement at 45 kilometers and a pilot with a Meteor calls Fox 3, he may as well be yelling Avada bloody cadaver. That's not to say there aren't ways to avoid getting hit by a Meteor. I, for example, might recommend ejecting. Perhaps unsurprisingly, by now the missile's been integrated on a number of platforms, including the Swedish Gripen, the French Rafale, the Eurofighter fleets of various nations, and integration efforts are ongoing for the F-35 and Korean KF-21. Now, obviously, I don't have shares in MBDA or the manufacturers of the PL-15, and I always try to be measured in the way I evaluate a bit of hardware. And so, in the effort to find some balance, I scoured the internet of any criticism I could find of this missile. Many of the critiques basically came down to saying that if you operated an older fleet of aircraft and couldn't detect your targets at long range, then Meteor wouldn't magically give you the ability to shoot them down. That makes a degree of sense, because remember, our first question at the start was not how far you can shoot, but first, how far can you see? But that's kind of like saying that Max Verstappen's not very good at Formula 1 because he can't win the race if you make him drive a Corolla. The problem in that situation isn't Verstappen, it's the equipment and enablers around him. In their report, Rusi note that Meteor is in the same range class as the PL-15, while at the same time it will, quote, likely retain a significantly larger no-escape zone and much better probability of kill at beyond 100 kilometers due to its ramjet propulsion system, end quote. So if we're looking for the current king of the AMRAAM-like category, This is my nomination. And when you look at a lot of European air forces, that capability might really matter. 
And that's because of the investment and force design decisions that a lot of these air forces have made. When you look at the aircraft that France, Germany, or Sweden rely on, you're looking at very capable fourth-generation platforms, things like Rafale and Eurofighter, that especially in their latest versions often have impeccable sensors, the ability to fuse data and find targets. But those nations didn't make the decision to go heavy into fifth-generation fighters, and as a result, they're relying on platforms that don't have stealthy features. That makes them potentially more vulnerable to just about everything, from ground-based air defences to opposing fighters. But with a missile like Meteor, those older aircraft may not have stealth features, but they do have, metaphorically, the longest stick. And while they may not be able to hide from something like a Russian flanker, being able to shoot it down from beyond its ability to effectively respond is probably another valid path towards some generally curb-stompy KD ratios. I bring this up mostly to highlight the value that investment in munitions as opposed to platforms can sometimes bring. Often, purchasing platforms is considered to be the sexy part of military procurement if there is indeed such a thing. But a high Mars without rocket is a truck with an articulated box on the back. A ship without enough surface-to-air missiles to fill the VLS cells might be a multi-billion dollar target, while an older generation aircraft like Rafale or F-16 might, by contrast, still be a very significant threat if they're bussing around a truckload of modern, capable missiles. And it's that that might make the fact that America has seemingly fallen behind all the more concerning for analysts and planners. Which means it's almost time to get into some of America's grand plans on how to redress the balance and reclaim the lead. But before we do, I want to add a quick addendum. We talked specifically here about Russian, Chinese, and European efforts. But make no mistake, the next generation air-to-air missile genie is very much out of the bottle. And if anything, these things are only going to proliferate further. India, for example, is currently in the process of speed running its way through developing indigenous air-to-air missiles. The Astra Mark 1, which entered service in 2019, is basically analogous to an older model AMRAAM. A solid rocket-powered 3.8 metre missile in reportedly the 110 kilometre range class. The Mark 1 is then meant to be followed by the Marks 2 and 3 using progressively more advanced propulsion systems, and with those new systems, longer and longer ranges. It's also reported that Japan intends to develop their own next-generation medium-range air-to-air missile to equip whatever next-generation fighter they're able to field through the GCAT program. That program is likely to build on research that's been ongoing since 2014, with Japan's joint new air-to-air missile, or JNAM, program, and which may potentially deliver yet another missile superior in performance to the AMRAAM. And while, hey, the Russians and the Chinese developing new generation weapons might be one thing, when you start saying that Japan is likely to enjoy a technological advantage over the US Air Force and Navy, there are probably a bunch of people in Hawaii whose spider sensors start tingling. And because this is the United States we're talking about, often there are really only two settings when it comes to development. Inaction or overwhelming reaction. Now, for a couple of reasons, going over the American programs isn't easy. Many of the release details are often vague or classified. There's a huge number of programs, and those programs run the full gamut from actual programs of record that are already delivering missiles for testing, all the way through to what still might be mostly conceptual efforts. So instead, I've decided to look at these as part of three broad categories, three broad kinds of air-to-air missile that America seems to think it needs for the future. First, a direct AIM-120 replacement to do AMRAAM things, but at longer ranges and more effectively. Secondly, a very long-range missile to go even further at the cost of a larger form factor. And thirdly, a new, much smaller missile, something with roughly the range and performance of the current AMRAAM, but shrunk down considerably so platforms can carry more missiles. But another way, the Air Force wants a better AMRAAM, a big RAM, and a small RAM. We've gone over many of the drivers for getting an AMRAAM replacement into the field, but clearly one of the most important drivers here is range. With a platform like the F-35, the combination of stealthy features, sensors, data links, and the ability to effectively fuse information should give a pilot an advantage in situational awareness, all else being equal. They should often, theoretically, be able to see an opponent before they see them, and it seems reasonable to expect that America's sixth-generation fighters should enjoy those same advantages but dialed up further. But to go back to General Kelly's reported comments, it's likely going to be difficult to fully leverage those advantages if your very capable fighters have to rely on what are, by this point, somewhat shorter-range missiles. Instead, you probably want a situation where opponents are being shot down by a target that they never even knew was there. So to really capitalise on their stealth features and sensors, platforms like the F-35 and F-22 need a longer-range missile that is suitable for internal carriage and which lets them shoot sooner and from further away. And according to General Kelly, the missile that will get the US Air Force and Navy to that point is the AIM-260 Joint Advanced Tactical Missile, or JATAM. Of all the missiles we're about to go through, JATAM is the one we know most about. 
It's reportedly been tested, is the closest of any of them to full rate production, and it's been repeatedly discussed by Secretary Kendall, who spoke in 2023 about wanting to move the missile to a higher rate of production and invest further in getting long-run production capacity increased. The joint in the name represents the fact the US Air Force and Navy have both been collaborating on this thing's development, which is great for efficiencies and savings, but terrible for my plan to name this thing the better AMRAM or BAMRAM. It's been reported that the tests of this particular Lockheed Martin product took place as far back as 2020 and 2021, and that when it enters service, what it's expected to give the US Air Force and Navy is essentially an enhanced air-to-air missile that all existing AMRAM and new AMRAM carriers like the Collaborative Combat Aircraft can carry, but which is likely to exceed the range of the Chinese PL-15. That would dramatically reduce the need for aircraft like the F-35 to potentially get too close to Chinese ground-based air defences, or to a variety of increasingly capable airborne sensor systems, before deciding they would prefer a particular track isn't there anymore. It would also mean that in a potential encounter between fourth-generation fighters, say F-15EX, as opposed to J-11 or Sukhoi-35, the EX, depending on various factors, might be able to reclaim the range advantage. And in a game where first-shot, first-kill advantage can be decisive, something like JATAM might seriously shift the modelling on air combat encounters. But while JATAM is expected to be an answer to some of the other systems on the market, think PL-15, Meteor, or the latest versions of R-77, it doesn't provide an equivalent capability to something like PL-17 or R-37M. But even with the Space Wizards of Lockheed Martin or Raytheon on the job, you probably can't fit a 400km range into an AMRAM-sized package. And so it looks like the US has a couple of concepts in play that might deliver that desperately desired extra reach at the cost of putting on more than a few pounds. One of these concepts is the incredibly creatively named long-range air-to-air missile concept from Boeing. We saw a half-scale model as concept shown off by Boeing back in 2021. And interestingly, that didn't appear to show a single-piece missile like the R-37 or the PL-17, but instead what looks like a two-stage design with a propulsion section that would handle most of the transit before dropping away to allow a smaller, presumably more agile kill vehicle to then go on and actually make the intercept. Now, as a concept, that offers a huge range of advantages. During the final stages of flight, the missile wouldn't be weighed down by the excess weight and bulk of the boost section, and instead might be closer in size and lethality to something like a short-range dogfighting missile. This might mean a system like this could engage a wider variety of targets, as compared to something much larger, like R-37, which really performs its best against targets the size of buildings. Another entrant in this category might be Raytheon's long-range engagement weapon. There are references to an LRU in budget documents going back to the 2010s, and while details, as with many of these missiles, are incredibly sparse, the concept here once again seems to be for something competing with the PL-17, not the 15. A large, potentially two-stage weapon with a very long reach that isn't suitable for internal carriage by fifth-generation fighters. And so with both of these systems, the most likely pairing isn't with the F-35 or F-22, but rather America's growing fleet of fourth-generation missile trucks, particularly F-15EX. As we spoke about earlier, fourth-generation platforms like F-15 going into the future are going to have to contend with the fact they just don't have the survivability that comes from the stealthy features of fifth- and sixth-generation fighters. Instead, they're likely to achieve survivability through distance. But precisely because they don't need those stealthy features, aircraft like F-15 can carry much larger, bulkier missile loads than F-22, F-35, or J-20. For me, the biggest confirmation that America eventually intends to field a longer-ranged air-to-air missile is the sheer amount of money they've been pumping into the F-15EX program. In a very high-threat environment, if those F-15s were just carrying JATAM or even AMRAM, their utility compared to just packing the force with more 5th gens would be in question. But if you can turn them into missile trucks for a longer-range weapon with which they can support the fifth-generation assets further forward, then suddenly their role in the broader air superiority concept becomes a lot clearer. Then, at the other end of the spectrum, you appear to have a couple of missile programs that trade away range improvements for significant improvements in form factor. This is the territory of things like the small advanced capabilities missile concept. And over the last decade, we've seen at least two firms tease relevant concepts or designs. Peregrine, for example, is reportedly a Raytheon product that was self-funded for a number of years until it picked up Air Force Research Laboratory funding in December 2022. Self-funding, by the way, is often a signal that a company really thinks a military should be buying a particular product and is willing to put its own capital forward to develop it until either someone in government agrees or management gets sick of a team burning capital without a buyer. This isn't like developing a new car or designing a handbag. If you build an air-to-air missile, you can't just put it on the shelf and try and sell it to members of the public if the government doesn't become a buyer. 
So I imagine Raytheon was probably pretty happy when the AFRL decided to support the program. What Peregrine is meant to be, reportedly, is a missile with roughly AMRAAM-like performance characteristics and range in a package about half the size. Another system with a similar pitch might be Lockheed Martin's CUDA. A concept model of this thing was shown off as far back as 2012, when it was described as a small AMRAAM-class radar-guided dogfight missile with about the same size as a small diameter bomb. Some reports indicate the missile began evaluating as far back as 2019, but its current status is an open question. But whatever specific missile you're talking about, whether it's Peregrine, Cuda, or some other design that we haven't even heard of, the basic pitch appears to be AMRAAM-esque performance in a half-size package. There may even be a modular missile system in the works where swapping out seekers and booster sections would allow you to customise the same core missile for different missions, capabilities, and form factors. But the bit I'm interested here is the ability to go small, and that potentially has immense utility. It might mean fifth-generation fighters could carry significantly more missiles internally, that relatively small combat drones might still be able to carry a useful quantity of missiles, and that when it comes to engaging targets that have to be shot down but don't demand a full AIM-260, things like, for example, the swarms of combat drones we might expect to see in future airspace, these missiles might give pilots an entirely acceptable engagement option, which doesn't empty their bays quite so quickly. And if you start to view these concepts and programs not as individual missiles, but instead as part of a broader whole, a broader theory on how future air combat might look, I'd argue you can start to see why multiple missiles might make sense. As we covered in the episodes on sixth-generation fighters and air combat drones, the US Air Force and Navy appear to be working towards a future where their fleets involve a number of very different platforms. There will be sixth- and fifth-generation fighters, combat drones, and then legacy fourth-generation platforms that have to hang back a bit further from high-threat airspace, but which can carry a lot of munitions. In each case, you might ask the question, what sort of missile does that platform need to make it sufficiently survivable and sufficiently lethal? For the fifth and sixth generation fighters, the stealth features underpin their survivability. As long, that is, as they have an option which doesn't force them to get so close to the enemy that they can then be detected. Hence, JATAM. They can also have a bit of a lethality problem because they're limited to the number of missiles they can carry internally. Adding a few peregrines or cooters to the mix might allow those aircraft to take more missiles with them and convert the natural advantages their stealth and sensors give them into, on average, more kills per sortie. The problem was not how far they could see, but rather how far, how effectively, and how many times they could shoot. For fourth-generation platforms, survivability has to come from range. But at the same time, lethality is supported by the fact these things can have massive payloads. So the solution might be a mixture between long and very long-range air-to-air missiles, whether that's JATAM mixed with LRAM or LRU or some other combination, massively increasing the reach of those missile trucks might have a similar effect on the number of scenarios in which you can actually confidently employ them. And then finally, you have your combat drones. And depending on the model, survivability here is probably going to come from a mixture of stealthy features, small size, and the fact that at the end of the day, while you'd rather not lose it, if it comes down to a choice between the drone and the manned platform, unless someone really pissed off HQ that week, it's probably going to be the drone. But a smaller drone or a missile delivery system like Longshot, which we've discussed in the past, could probably benefit from having a small, capable air-to-air missile like the Peregrine or Cuda per collaborative combat aircraft, European remote carrier, or whatever other concept you want to go with. The point here, as we established earlier, is that advantages can compound. Having better aircraft is an advantage. Having better trained pilots is an advantage. Having better sensors and networking is an advantage. But if you start compounding those advantages together and then throw in a new generation of world-leading air-to-air missiles, then unless your opponent moves to match you, the actual performance and capability gap is going to widen dramatically. According to statements by senior US officials, US strategy in any major conflict is not just to pursue air superiority, but air dominance. But that level of superiority, which has almost been assumed for decades at this point, doesn't come easily. And it's hard to imagine how America could secure it against increasingly powerful competitors without a new generation of missiles that can deliver the kind of superiority AMRAAM once did. For now, it seems like the Chinese and Europeans may actually have taken a lead in a number of areas. But only time will tell if this slew of new development programs ultimately hands Washington back, metaphorically at least, the longest stick. And with it, the ability to compound advantages in other systems and platforms into a force capable of fighting for air dominance in the 21st century. Okay, channel update to close out. Firstly, thank you as always to those patrons who voted for the topic. This video is really intended to build on those episodes that have already covered 6th generation fighters and air combat drones. 
And while I enjoy doing a good standalone episode, I do have a special appreciation for these sort of mini-series, where I can try to build out a broader topic one segment at a time. So far as the channel itself goes, I should have some updates on future plans next week. But for now, I hope it's enough for me to extend my thanks to all of you as always. A special thanks to everyone who contributed to this episode, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week.